Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 6 of the Strength in the Numbers show, which you can find with detailed show notes and relevant links on how to accelerate your finance and accounting career at SITN show slash podcast slash 006. On today's show, we've Scott Hirsch, who is currently Finance Director Customer Service Pricing and Recurring Revenue Operations at Dell EMC, the third largest privately controlled company on the planet following the acquisition of EMC by Dell in 2016. Scott's team is tasked with protecting and growing $4 billion plus of prepaid and renewal maintenance revenues and is a big user of cognitive computing technologies to combine data in legacy Oracle and SAP systems and also leverages finance business partnering to provide insights into optimizing customer lifetime value, delivering benefits for his end user customers and Dell EMC via better pricing of services. Now, Scott was previously a management consultant at Accenture in their operations consulting practice working on many value-adding projects across many different industries. Uh, Scott has also participated in a number of entrepreneurial adventures and holds an MBA in entrepreneurship from Babson. And on the show, Scott shares why he loves working in services, finance, and some of the opportunity areas for other accounting and finance professionals to go after and add value to their businesses and make an impact. He also shares some of the baby steps we can take to be successful at leveraging cognitive computing technologies in ways that allow us to get intimate with the data, but also share data-driven insights, understanding, and stories with our relevant stakeholders in the business. And as a former outsider to finance, he candidly shares what he dislikes most about our traditional mindset and mentalities, but also why it's a great place to currently be involved in, the amount of opportunities we have, and also shares his thoughts on why we're perhaps holding back our creativity at the moment and where we can perhaps overcome those. And finally, which I thought he was just being very honest, he shares some of his hard-won lessons in overcoming finance politics. And he also shares some other advice that would have allowed him to capture better some of the opportunities that are presented earlier in his career. I really enjoyed recording this show because Scott is one of the most strategic thinkers I've ever had the pleasure of working with. So it's no accident he's involved in delivering top-line value for bridging the gap between the market, the customer, and the business he works in. And you'll learn loads on this episode as we deconstruct Scott's pearls of wisdom. He's also got a great self-deprecating sense of humour and he's just an all-round great person. So without further ado, let's go over to Scott and the show. So Scott, welcome to the show. Hi Andy, thanks for having me. Boy, who's this guy you're talking about? <laughs> Don't worry, we set the bar high on this show, Scott. <laughs> so, uh, so Scott, it's really great to have you on. Thanks for making the time for us um, to share your thoughts and ideas with our accounting and finance listeners today. I'd imagine they'd appreciate if you can share briefly your story on how you got into your career and your current role in accounting and finance. Absolutely. Well, I should probably qualify for everybody that uh, I've always uh, maybe been insecure about my role in finance. I maybe at one point early in my finance career, which is later, the later half of my career so far, considered myself a you know faux finance person, which I, I kind of chuckle about. Um, and that's because I don't have a pure finance background or an accounting degree or anything like that or a CPA. Although I'm married to somebody who has a CPA, I never wanted to get yeah I never wanted to get into finance, <laughs> so maybe that qualifies me. No, I actually I started in operations. I've always had a mind for how things work and and how businesses tick. I come from an entrepreneurial family, so consulting seemed like the best route. As you said, I was in uh, I was at Accenture in supply chain management and operations consulting for seven years. And uh, I did that because I, I wanted to understand the business world uh, a lot better from the ground up, really understand how companies operate, how to spot problems, how to diagnose them, how to uh, analyze uh, data and, and, uh, and, and fix things, just how I'm kind of driven 
And in doing that, I, you know, I sort of backed into finance because a lot of the work that I was doing was so analytical and the things that got us jobs in, in consulting were tied to the bottom line. And, you know, these conversations that we had with our clients were with, with the CFO or with a general manager type person. And it was always, you know, what's the business case and then how are we going to go achieve our financial objectives? And so when I left consulting and, and was finally able to commit to something, <laughs> so the good way not to commit to something is to, is to do everything. I ended up in, in a finance operations role, which was actually, in retrospect, a great way to get into finance for, for those of us who are not lucky enough to have decided we wanted to do finance for a career. And I, I ended up, little by little, uh, having my, my mind taken over by, by the, the finance world. And that's how I got into it, was uh, being a curious person and, and wanting to solve problems and using numbers and data. And I, I ended up at EMC in the services finance organization. And that's where you seem seem to have stayed. So, so is there anything about services that you particularly enjoy working in? Um, I, I mean, I guess there must be loads of different, I suppose, business partners. If I, you know, if you imagine pricing, for instance, uh, you're you're probably interacting with a lot of different uh, stakeholders there. So, so. Is there any particular advantages or things you like most about working in services? You know what? It's it's what I love to do. I think it's a fabulous area for finance uh, to make a huge difference. I, I think services was a natural fit because of the operations type work I was doing. So there's a direct connection to making a difference for, for customer satisfaction. There's an operational component. I think services in general is underappreciated as a revenue driver and as a customer retention driver for companies. Um, you know, companies that do service best, like Apple, is a, such an obvious example because everyone talks about it. People are so delighted with the whole package and the service that they'll come back again and again and again. And so services is a great place to be. And I've always found that there's been so much opportunity um, because it's usually the, the place that businesses look last. And, and and actually, it, it in my biased opinion, places that they it's a place that they should look first, and it's incredibly complicated. Um, delivering high quality service is not easy, so I think there's a lot of need for for bright people uh, who are motivated to make a huge difference. Yeah, I, I, precisely, Scott. And I'm just trying to think. You know, you touched there on on opportunities like uh, i suppose in general terms obviously don't want to give you you know you to give away the secret sauce and get you in, in any trouble but you know for people looking for opportunities that are in finance and in services sort of what areas could they be maybe look at pursuing i think if you're entrepreneurial in nature the best place to be in services is really understanding where the intersection of, of services and, and revenue is and, and playing in that space so services pricing is a space that you mentioned that, that I, I'm involved in that I love because uh, so many folks in finance uh, who are in services look at cost. What's our cost to serve? What are our, you know, if we have humans out in the field providing service to customers, what do they cost? How many hours are they spending per ticket if, if that's the way that the operation works? You know, how many parts are we uh, sending out? the uh, gross cost of those and you know how do we minimize cost and at the same time maximize customer satisfaction you know big companies tend to have that down locked uh, and locked pretty well i think you know if if that's if that's what you enjoy doing uh, if you have more of a supply chain bent there's nothing wrong with that it's actually an exciting space and i think managing the challenge of minimizing cost and maximizing effectiveness and value for the customer is is i think very interesting i just think having having had the pleasure of being able to see you know how do we generate directly generate revenue from our services contracts and provide you know uh, really high quality experience for customers and how does that tie into the overall total cost of ownership and how do we price it effectively it's opened my eyes to um, this whole space of recurring revenue which i think is is the future of where service is going is you know everything now is as a subscription mm -hmm. and so if you can lock in a customer and provide value and it's and it's an easy transaction and they essentially you know it's like a gym membership uh, these are really high profit margin type deals and they're great from 
you know, a consistency standpoint, having tons of deferred revenue uh, on the balance sheet or um, having, you know, these uh, recurring revenue contracts out there that, you know, where the customer is essentially giving you their credit card and then and then it gets renewed. That's such an interesting space right now. I think there's such a great need for people in, in the finance community to understand how that adds value to the company. And specifically because it's so new for big companies like Dell, having finance people who can help bridge the gap uh, between the old model, which is, you know, we sell our customers something that is is a large capital purchase, uh, like a either, a, you know, a, a, a new storage array or on the software side, you know, a, a huge license for software. And then, you know, they pay a maintenance contract. That's slowly changing into I don't want to own a physical asset as a customer. I want to pay per usage. And I think, you know, that poses a dilemma to companies like like Dell EMC, uh, where the old model uh, is still such a huge proportion of overall profitability and cash flow and margin, you know, how do you bridge the gap between that and the future world that where everything is on the drip or is consumption based people who are, are new to the finance world and who want to really make a huge difference that that space, I think, is relatively poorly understood. And there's a lot of great career opportunity there. And actually, I the way you were describing that, Scott, I, I guess businesses that do not have this sort of mindset um, historically and are sort of adapting and changing like like how do they go about i i can only imagine there must be so much data to get your arms around in such a huge business what was it four billion dollars plus you're responsible for so like how how do you get your arms around all of this data there's got to be loads of it there is loads of it and absolutely you've you've got to understand and this is what we've been spending the past couple of years on in my team is how do you actually make money and I, I, I think people will be shocked to hear that. And it's like so obvious, right? You, you have revenue and you have cost and, and uh, you figure it out. Well, we know that we make money, but how do you actually, what are the drivers that really make money? And, and how, do they, how do these maintenance contracts actually work? And what is a customer worth across its lifetime? And how do you earn that revenue? And where does this stuff sit in our financials? I think... Um, Getting really intimate with the data, uh, and and we're so lucky at EMC uh, to have such great data management products. One of which, and I'll put a plug in for the company, is a pivotal product, <laughs> Greenplum. Um, you know, I think a brilliant thing that EMC did, uh, I think probably about three years ago now, or 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 more, was to use this product, which is a, it's like a data warehouse on steroids. Uh, and, and open it up to the analyst community. And, and what, what I mean by that is very few companies expose their corporate data, um, you know, unfiltered, uh, uh, kind of unedited uh, in raw format and, and complete without restriction. Um, assuming, of course, you, you, know, you have the right credentials to get into the space. Very few companies uh, offer, the, offer you the ability as a business analyst to, to tap into that. And EMC decided that they wanted IT to be more like a service, which I think is, a, is another great trend happening in the IT world. And, and so that gave us the opportunity to go play around and really learn. And we deal with tables, massive tables that are, that are holding rich transaction history, hundreds of millions of rows of data on our customers, on, our, on their transactions. Um, you know who they are. What kind of pricing are we offering them? What are they buying? How they, how are they consuming it? You know what kind of maintenance contracts do they have? And so you start with the high level view, and then you start drilling and drilling and creating relationships between. You know, I think many large companies have issues where they have so much siloed information in all these different systems. Having it in one place where you can relate all the data together is so powerful, and that allows you to start saying, well. Can I actually understand what the customer lifetime journey is? And like you mentioned, customer lifetime value. Can I can I put that in a picture? And can I explain that to my business partner? You know, here's a typical example of 
how we make money, where we make it, where the margin is, and then get them to really understand that because I think very few people have an intuitive understanding of how all that works. We've spent a lot of time getting to that point to be able to express it in a simple financial model where we really understand the points of leverage and where we make money and where we don't. Then you have a real solid data-driven understanding of the business and you can say, okay, well, we're willing to make this trade off now in terms of cash to get customer locked in and we know we know how long our customers typically own products um, you know how many times they upgrade how much software they use uh, what our what our uh, pricing is and and so you can then adapt that and create new models and you and you are much more confident in terms of the ability to, to take risks and do something different whereas if you don't have that intimacy with the data you don't understand the customer journey um, you're not tracking this type of information um, and really conf- supremely confident uh, in how this works at scale. Um, good luck, that's all <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> Very well, important. Look, I- but look, I was you know, the way you were describing that there, Scott. It's like you know, this is ideally set up for accounting and finance professionals to go in. So you know, the revenue, the costs, understanding how they're both interacting with each other over a period of time. We're very good looking at patterns and trends. But I guess being in- intimate with the data, and particularly the way you describe it, millions and millions of rows of customer data. Like, what would be the baby steps we could take to actually get more intimate with the data? It's an excellent question because I think I'm fortunate because I, I've always been technical and I took coding classes and in school and I had on you know, you said entrepreneurial adventures and I started my own business businesses and I've always been very um, uh, self sufficient when it comes to either putting up a website or, or doing consulting work for other clients of mine and and being hands-on in that sense. So it came naturally to me. I think it doesn't come naturally to a lot of finance people because their specialty is is in financial analysis, not in getting information. And so I think, you know, some of the baby steps certainly are upskilling and and learning uh, about how to be self-sufficient. I think finance people are excellent at asking the right questions hey, what if I could get this and I want to see it this way and let's cut it that way. Um, Where I think maybe more experienced finance professionals who haven't really grown up with, you know, this digital revolution, who are hungry to get information but don't have the right skills to get it themselves and are relying on IT departments, you know, who are always bogged down to build things for them, really need to come to grips with the fact that, uh, you know, to be highly effective in, in what's always a lean finance organization. They've got to be more self-sufficient in that sense. And so I think, um, you know, baby steps, right? Uh, experimenting, learning SQL, which is is a fairly easy language, getting exposed to, you know, how data works. I'd say if you were to start at, at nowhere, you know, from, from zero, you taught this to me, Andy, I think the best place is to start with mapping the customer journey and really understanding, okay, here's here's how we market to customers, quote, sell, ship, service. And and if you can trace that through, even in Excel, you can go into all the systems and you can say, let me, let me just see what happens to an order over time. You can start to build things without knowing SQL. And then you start to say to yourself, I really want to automate this. And then you can go in the systems and you can start pulling this data in an automated way and bridging it together. But really, if you want to get way more advanced than that. Ultimately, you, you have to come to grips with, you know, if you're a manager, hiring people who are really technical, or if you're an individual contributor, getting to the point where, and I've always thought this was, there are two great things, right? One is, you know what, take a low risk project and just try it, right? Mm-hmm. Go, go pull your own data, you know, see what happens, make mistakes, fail, but it's a low risk kind of proposition. Um, I love the fact that you know, you're encouraging people to fail. And I think that's something that accounting and finance professionals need to get used to when we venture into these new areas. Yes, we're going to fail. But if we look at our strengths in the numbers historically, what you were suggesting about understanding the process, the journey, the customer journey end to end, we're very good at walkthrough testing. I remember doing them back in my audit and assurance days, you know, so we can do that. Oh, and guess what? What accountant doesn't know how to use Excel? We can use that too. So we've got some good building blocks to work from that you've already suggested. 
Is there anything else that we should perhaps consider as a step to take, or, or is that pretty much it? I think there's one more step that you can take, and, and that's start with things that are low risk and, and build your build your knowledge base there. And I've always come to work and, and encourage people on my team to do two things. One is I love the Google. I think it's Google that does this, or maybe it's just a technology thing. Spend 20% of your time on stuff that you're interested in, gut uh, hunches about you know things where where you think there might be value. We don't allocate enough time, I think, in finance to being creative and exploring. <laughs> so true. And and yeah, I, I mean that's no knock, but I think we have so much responsibility to running the business that we don't allocate enough time. And so big thank you to um, you know two three important people in my life, you, my former manager, and my current manager, for having the vision to say you know. We're going to carve out a specialty finance team that's not working on quarter end close and is not working on just reporting, but is more of a, you know, for lack of better terms, skunk works or <laughs> our ninja team that's focused on the future. And so, you know, that's that's so critical. Uh, you have to have people who are in finance who are not focused on today or yesterday, yeah. backwards looking. We have to be focused on where do we think the opportunities lie? Where do we think we have problems? Areas that we couldn't explore if we had so much on our plate. That's not to say we're not busy. It's just to say it's a different focus. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, in addition to trying things that are low risk uh, and experimenting, spending 20% of your time, literally 20% of your time doing things that are, quote unquote, off the grid or different, uh, because those are always the greatest sources for inspiration. And the third thing is, Come into work every day and do something better and improve yep. something. If it's if it's the way you organize yourself, if it's the way that you run a certain data set, if it's uh, you know a certain process, automate it, get it off your plate, make it better, improve it, and then move on. And I think that's so important. And I, I always tell the people that I work with is if you don't come in every day with the attitude of I'm going to fix something and make it better or innovate, then I think you're losing out on, on many opportunities to drive results faster. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering here, Scott, is that is that the entrepreneur in you speaking? Because um, <laughs> this innovation, creativity, it doesn't, it's not normally traditionally finance, but in all seriousness, is that perhaps one of the key qualities we need to be developing in this age of digital disruption? I, yeah, maybe maybe you're right. I I think uh, you know finance could use a little bit. Maybe not the accounting. We don't want creative accounts running. <laughs> creative, <laughs> of course, yes, well qualified. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, yes, I definitely think so. In in this age where it's funny, um, I told you this. My last year child, her, she was in kindergarten, and the teacher in in the back to school night said, "We're training your kids." so that they won't be replaced by robots in the future. Wow. And <laughs> it blew it's, my mind, first yeah. of all, that the kindergarten teacher was telling me this, so maybe a little bit too much at such a young <laughs> age. But I think that applies to finance, right? Because so much of what we do as finance professionals can either be offshored, done cheaper somewhere else, can be automated, and how do we get out of that rut? You know, We, we have to be thinking more dynamically, more creative, you know, one of the things that as a outsider to the finance community, maybe not so much anymore, I really don't like about finance is the uh, shoemaker son mentality is we, we have to live uh, without any means, you know, we, we have to lead by example, and not spend any money and, and not travel and, uh, you know, to, to be with other colleagues. And, you know, we're, we're a, you know, overhead function. No, that's not how we should operate as <laughs> finance okay. professionals. We need to invest in tools. We need to invest in our own productivity potential because if we don't do these things, if we don't spend more time being creative and giving our business partners uh, creative solutions, how irrelevant are we going to be in the future? And so, yes, you're right. I, I do say that's very entrepreneurial thinking, but I don't think as of, of finance as being black and white and, and, and so defined. I think finance has tremendous power when you've got people in leadership positions in the finance world who who really get it mm -hmm. and can help the business i think it can be an incredibly uh useful and valuable role within the company because it is the one place really next to i don't know corporate strategy uh that has an understanding of how the business works from end to end 
completely agree, Scott. Before I jump into some more rapid fire questions, I, I did have one because given your background in consulting practice and moving to industry, just in case we have some listeners out there who've sort of moved from practice or consulting into industry or maybe even thinking of making the switch. I was curious, you know, is there any particular skills you, you brought from that world into your current world or is there anything looking back on it you could probably have done differently to make your transition a bit easier? <laughs> Those are two very different questions. I know. I get them uh, uh, um, You know, I think I think I had mentioned already uh, the type of skills that I brought from consulting into yeah. finance. I think I was not prepared for a finance uh, career coming from consulting. I had to learn a lot of very hard lessons. I really didn't understand what finance did. And, you know, I would say uh, the biggest challenge that I really had was figuring out how finance adds value and what, what our role is in finance. You know, if you're coming from consulting or, or outside into finance, I think the the biggest thing, really, there's a couple. One is, and I and I've been asked this question before. You know, how can you really get people's attention in finance? You know, if you see something that that needs to be addressed, and maybe this is a big company syndrome, but we operate in such a political environment sometimes. You may see something that you think is so obvious. Um, and as a as an operations professional professional, I would want to just go fix it. But <laughs> explaining to to stakeholders and getting them to understand and educating them in some in some cases, you know, especially if you're in pricing, uh, you're doing that type of work. It's very hard to understand this stuff. It's very hard to explain some of the finance concepts. You know, you're staring at a spreadsheet all day. You get it. It makes sense when you're doing the work. But then try and bring that ten levels up. Uh, not easy. So I think you know. Understanding the politics of, of finance, uh, one of the best things you taught me, Andy, was, you know, just because uh, the company may not be interested in something that you think is important today doesn't mean that you shouldn't do your job and write up a business case mm-hmm. and document what you've seen and, and your, your analysis and approaches and put it in a desk drawer because it may not be the right time, uh, as important as something may be, but next month it might be. So I think being in finance, you have the unique position to, to to sort of have an arsenal of things, and and there's never a shortage of things that you want to do. Yeah. Um, so being able to not get discouraged uh, if you're coming from outside of the finance world, and and really just you know build your not only credibility but but maybe ability to come up with ideas. I think finance finance good finance people like good salespeople, you know if if there's trouble. You should be able to know uh, where the change is hidden under the couch cushion. Um, <laughs> so, That's a good expression. That, yeah, that was that was a great learning experience for me. Is is you know, hey, just take your great ideas, file them away, uh, lobby, continue to you know educate people. But it takes time. You got to be patient. I, 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 that's a very important principle. I think it does take time. Just don't think you know you've got all these cool skills you can bring with you. And yes, you know you've got these strengths. And yes, you can make a difference it's just going to take time you have to adapt to the environment you're in and and again sometimes it might mean being very patient and that's i I can certainly relate to to that earlier in my career some things would just be so obvious like why aren't you doing them well we may not have necessarily developed the necessary rapport relationships or chosen the right time yet but isn't it great when you've done the work and someone is looking for some help the need is so obvious, they want it. And they say, oh yeah, by the way, this is what I was working on earlier. Does this help? And it's, and it like actually might be the answer someone's looking for. So great words of wisdom there, Scott. And I think there's going to be many people out there that will find it easier to get through those frustrations now that you shared them, because I think a lot of us have been there. And uh, thank you for being so open and sharing them with us. Absolutely. Thank so, you. So Scott, now I'm going to jump into the lightning question round. Right. In terms of, I think well, I want you to think back uh, to your much younger years, your younger self, say when you were starting off in your career, sort of fresh out of college. Um, what would your advice be now to your younger self? The following: uh, Hey Scott, uh, you really have a lot to learn. <laughs> 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 you, you, <clears throat> you've you've got a great education, um, but it's not even half of what you need to know. So your job for the next you know, five to seven years should be 
uh, to consider yourself an apprentice and uh, and be patient about your career path and learn and and experience as much as possible, travel, meet as many people, build your network. And that should be your focus as opposed to, you know, I think a lot of recent graduates think, well, especially ones coming out of Babson, oh, I think uh, I'm going to be the CEO, you know, as soon as I graduate. It's a little bit of, of rubbish. And so I think um, having some patience and some and some perspective, I don't know if it would have served me better, but I but I think I maybe I would have captured some opportunities that I wouldn't have because I was too impatient to uh, accelerate my career. Yeah, actually, and, and I was thinking because because your entrepreneurial background as well has got the very wise words. I remember being too eager trying to close a deal with a client. You know, I, I had the value to offer. I could definitely make a difference. But I was just too quick. I didn't invest the necessary time in building the relationships. And boy, that cost me many tens of thousands over the years. And, you know, unfortunately, that was a painful lesson. And it's important we share these things we've gone through and the importance of patience and taking the time. I like your word apprentice. I think that's the most apt word. You're serving an apprenticeship and, you know, do what you can. Do all the dirty jobs, roll the sleeves up. Because that's that's we're going to develop the gut instinct later on in our careers, where we can then move faster than some machines or or make the right calls on certain plays, when the business really needs us to. So mm. fantastic advice. So Scott, I was also thinking, perhaps if you could recommend maybe one book, audio book, or a documentary to our listeners, what would it be? Uh, you probably want me to give a an answer in terms of a business book, right? <laughs> well, f- funny you should say that most people on the on the podcast so far, and it is early days, uh, have been giving sort of non-business finance books. So uh, I'm curious, and I think all our listeners are as curious as to what you think um, would be a good book to help build, build on their strengths. Well, clearly I would start with the audacious finance partner. Um, <laughs> I wonder who wrote that one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's it's actually it's a, a lot of these lessons are in that book. So no, I, I I'm I'm serious about that. I I think um, I've gotten away from business books. You know, I've read I've read some that I really enjoyed a lot. Like the goal is a great operations book, and it's a funny story. Uh, you know, I've read uh, maybe not business but economics. Um, Freakonomics was an incredible book that really Definitely. opened my eyes. You know, for a while there, I was really interested in in um, investing, and so that led me to a book that I think is just so basic and is more of a personal finance type of book. It's called uh, "The Richest Man in Babylon." Oh, one of my favorites. It's yeah, just so simple, oh. and, and I think the book really taught me about discipline and understanding uh, how wealth creation works. And if you're interested in finance, I'm assuming you're interested in creating wealth for yourself. And so that book I really enjoyed. I also enjoyed some biographies. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to say now that I, re- I liked reading <laughs> The Art of the Deal, which is Donald oh, Trump's book. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. That's from, sitting from, on my Kindle. Too. Is it worth reading, Scott? It was a great book, yeah. But okay. but in the in the context now, where Donald Trump is the president of the United States, it's it's maybe not something I would have gone gone to <laughs> at first. He, I think I think Donald Trump had this real persona, you know, before he got into politics. I was so intriguing and captivating. It was a great book, um, and Lee Iacocca's book, uh, I think it's called Straight Talk or something like that. I enjoyed, but yeah, I I I, uh, I have a, a wide variety of interests. I think. In terms of business, so many of those books that are out there uh, are so boring and and um, you know really hard to follow. So I, I I think the classics, and if I had to pick one, would probably be the Richest Man in Babylon. Really enjoy that book. Definitely. And look, uh, I'm going to put all the links to the books and resources you suggested in the show notes. Uh, but I, I even I like that book so much, I even read it to my kids. <laughs> Give them a head start. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes yeah no thanks thanks Emil. thank you so much scott for suggesting those so scott i uh, you know again thank you for providing uh, these insights to our listeners on, on how to build our strength in numbers if uh, any of the listeners uh, want to find out more about you or connect with you where is the best place for them to reach out and find you at? i think the best place probably is linkedin if they want to find me on there i, I certainly love to connect with people and so uh, for the most part i think you can find my profile 
Okay, so I get I, I got to put your link up on the show notes, Scott. So people yeah, that'd can be great. reach out to you Absolutely. there. Absolutely, yeah. Good way to connect professionally. Always happy to to talk to people. And again, Scott, thank you so much for investing the time with us today. You've been a great guest, and we really appreciate your insight. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Andy, and good luck with the rest of your podcasts. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers.